Hey guys, this will be video 20 for the uh, Gibson Les Paul uh, custom restoration. Uh, I'm gonna, this is gonna be pretty much a, a completely different video, but the only thing I will mention is that I, in the last video, I was just gonna show the fitment of the, how the nut relates to the overlay on this guitar because the overlay is about an eighth of an inch thick. Put your binding in a completely different location in relation to uh, if you're doing like a historical type uh, R8, R9 type type build where the uh, headstock does not have an overlay. Uh, it's just like a painted or the, the overlay is extremely thin and it's just painted or stained and stuff like that. So I'll touch on that a little bit more later on. But right now I'm just going to dive right in and discuss the neck a little bit, probably for about 15 minutes and then the, uh, some more layout and then I'm going to pull the body over and possibly do some wet sanding and demo how I blend the uh, lacquer, the new lacquer into the old, uh, the, the nitro now that we've let it dry for about a week or so. So let me just pick right back. One thing I didn't, uh, didn't mention in the last video, the files that I've grabbed up and started using, they're, they're round on one side and then they're flat on another. And they are the cross-cut file, and they, and if they collect any bit of dust or build up, you know, just a little bit of bumping or hitting with the wire brush, and they're clean. All right, no sense in talking about files anymore. But I guess uh, somebody asked me something about the best tools to use for doing woodworking, and I had no idea. I had worked wood forever, but uh, once I started building guitars and started realizing how beneficial files and rasps were uh, it was amazing i realized man you, you don't even need a router you don't you really there's so many things you thought you needed that you don't need because this is such delicate work anyway that uh, i learned the importance of of it being the art the artistic side of it when i was talking about going to woodcraft let me make sure this is in the video i, I moved over to the high table and I got everything in a different location. When I was talking about going to Woodcraft and buying like these in a three set, I'm pretty sure these were sold in a three set and you you can uh, loosen the, the shaft right there and pull that out and replace that. These are the original rasps that I bought 16 years ago, 17 years ago. I broke one and I replaced it, but you've got one that has a flat with a with a real soft point and then it's radius on the back this is the one that i was using when i was carving out of the um, headstock into the neck i was rolling that radius back the same thing with the file and then when i mentioned then you can reach up here and do flat work i flipped it over because it has a flat side now this is a triangle and don't let that get anywhere near your heel or your headstock because man you'll you'll cut a 16th inch deep gouge before you know it and uh, you'll be in trouble this is really good for uh, if you were doing some sort of some sort of fitment right here where you had a well this is perfect you can see where there's like some excess wood right here you could come in here and you know that that's a dangerous area you wouldn't want to get into that hill so you could come in here and you could kind of clean up that little bit of um, uh, excess or either glue let's say you were going to re uh, attach this neck you can come in with that triangle and you can clean out that corner so you make sure that everything beds really well and then the other one this one is round and it's incredible if you're uh, needing to open up a, a hole that you drilled that was a little bit small or either you had some paint or some lacquer run down in like a tuner location and you knew you wanted to be real ginger about taking it out, you can take this rasp and just kind of ease around the hole and it'll knock that stuff out. And it creates very small uh, shavings so it stays really clean. Uh, and then I didn't really talk too much about the uh, the jig and the router. That, that really is like a 45 minute video in itself. But I'm just gonna show you, I did start with a, a sacrificial piece and that was like the the surface of the neck and then that would have been the angle and then uh i didn't mention you you really need to especially on this neck here let me just stay on point you, you glue a little block right here so that your your bearing 
has somewhere to, to travel to and, and keep your bit under control. If you don't, you know, if you're just sitting here trying to route a raw board and then make sure that you're just real safe about pulling that router away bef before you eat a quarter of the board, forget it. It's not going to happen. You're so wound up focused on holding a handheld router in place that you've got to have some sort of little block glued right there to keep you from making a mistake. And that's, if you, if you don't understand that, just rewind it and kind of think through what would happen if this router bit is running across here, running across here, running across here, running across here, and then all of a sudden I go off this end. Well, that router is going to turn a curve <laughs> and it's going to round off anything on that corner. So get that out of sight, out of mind. This is what I meant by, you know, uh, you if this is your router, let's see if this is on the video. If this is your router, you know, your bits down in here, and I prefer using the acrylic a quarter or a thirteen, and then I just drive the cut that out with a hole saw first and then drive your bit through there so there's not a huge gap. Uh, for safety uh, for safety safety circumstances but also because we're working in very small areas I want as much surface contact back here on my um, work piece as possible if you've got a, a, a gaping hole back here you'd be surprised you'll get over here and you'll 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 dip or like when you're coming off that bottom out here you might dip out if this had a large opening so make your own uh, uh, plate and, and it, let it be specialized for doing real intricate work like that. Uh, and I can almost digress there. Uh, and I'm, I hope I don't forget what I was going to say. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, just by having this, you know, most router bases are just round. Well, that's fine in a normal world, but we're not in a normal world. We're routing something that literally goes from uh, roughly three quarters of an inch wide up to only seven eighths or, or an inch and that's why you have to have you have to have that platform back there for the router to be to be riding on and this is what I failed to mention in the last video and I'm gonna do it right now before I forget that's why I left that flat on there because it actually allowed the base somewhere somewhere else to just land on and make sure that I didn't, you know, tip off the the, the workpiece. So, if the if the video ended right there, I would feel confident knowing that I, I covered that because that was very important. That was some of my main reasoning why I left those little flats on. All right, so create a sacrificial piece, test the depth of your router bit, just see how 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 close you can really, how low you can really go, how low you can really go with your bit before before you make the 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 hor horrible mistake of rounding off that corner and eating half of your uh, platform as well and at that point that neck is gone once you lose that material right there you're either gluing boards up well not quite frankly no because you've you've routed the route is even gone beyond your target right there the neck is gone so anyway, not talk about the. We don't want to talk about the bad things that can happen, but we want to make sure that we anticipate what could happen, so that we know that when, once we pull the trigger on that tool, your buddies aren't there, the radio's off. You're 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 focused on two things: the most important thing, safety, and the, the second most important thing is safety. The third, safety, and then the fourth the fourth thing would be not damaging the workpiece. So safety, 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 and then uh, relax and do a good job. So anyway, no sense to talk about that anymore. But I think that makes sense. Most of you, most of you router guys out there already know, you know these things. But if you're if you're seriously thinking about doing something like this, and you've only used a router to maybe make some, you know, you know maybe a tabletop or something like that, just just you know use common sense and go from there. Uh, make note of how, how, how flat the fretboard surface has remained um, and this is probably mostly because this is maple or it's either mahogany 
and our moisture content is typically should be around 6% or less. You don't want to be working with wet wood that you bought off of your local thrifty shop that was in somebody's basement. I don't care if it is mahogany or if it is maple. If, if, if it's a, from a scenario like that, let it acclimate to your shop for a good month to three months. Not, not a week, not, a, not three or four days, but a month to two or three weeks to two or three months before you really start working that piece. Um, that's why I like woodcraft in any of your, your uh, large cities. I used the woodcraft up in Franklin, Tennessee for about oh, about 12 years and I uh, love those people. They were very knowledgeable and always had incredible wood. And I used Constantine's in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so anyway, giving those guys a plug. What I'm going to talk about now briefly is just how um, I know I mentioned, where are we? Not too bad, we're at 10 minutes. Uh, I had mentioned, uh, study your subject, train your hand, and uh, visit a vintage guitar shop. Yeah, that's pretty important. I want to make sure I cover that, but I may have already covered this enough that I don't need to go into it. But basically, as you're working these areas, this is probably a better view. Oh, I know what I was going to say. This doesn't have to be in a jig. Find your favorite uh, stool in your shop, pull this baby out of the jig, start start cradling it, start holding it, and start getting a feel for it, and then start working it, you know, and, you, and then you'll be able to twist and turn and look. If you've got it all clamped up in a jig, it's the same principle of when I was shaping that arch top on the body. I don't want to see anything but the guitar, period, and a white wall. And when you've got this in your hand, you're literally sitting there going, eh, you know, that, that pencil line could go in a little bit deeper. So, and, and you just start, again, I'm making sure I keep that bottom far away from that corner. Because if you get into that right there, man, it's major. If you, lose, if you lose that beautiful compound turn right there. So, and where I'm going to go with this is pretty important, but you're just sitting here getting a feel for it, and you'll be surprised how, and when I start getting up here into the flat, you'll be surprised how much you can do with this little round. I can start doing some of the flat work, some of the flat work bending. I wouldn't, don't, don't come up here that's just common sense. If you start doing this, you're going to start cutting ruts into it. But you could come across like this just briefly if you saw a high spot. But for right now, where I'm, the reason I brought this tool back up, I wanted you to see not only is this very good for right here, it is positively incredible for the heel location. Just hold this baby in your hand get a feel for it and I'm going to talk about mental mapping again and visiting a guitar shop and uh, making friends with uh, the pros um, but basically you know you can sit here you've made some pencil marks along along this this center and man you you better especially this neck if I if I see those pencil marks in the middle disappear I'm in trouble I'm in very serious trouble so this is again why I got the radio off and I'm not thinking about high school or muscle cars or you know any, any of that crap. You turn that stuff off and really focus on what it is you're doing. Don't start rounding over here. You know you, you've made a very important mark location back here that you'll blend later. And I've already, I even made a little paper template to per the old neck. So anyway you can, you can use these tools for that area as well. That's probably an inch and a quarter, give or take. Uh, the, the bigger the drum, the more difficult it is to feel the neck. But if you stay around one and a quarter to two inches, it, it fits your palm hand really good, and you're very much connected to the neck. Okay, nothing, nothing bad. Uh, let me just read this. Uh, study your subject. What's our subject? This is our target. Study it study it because I might have three other guitars in my shop that this is all I've been working on for six months big fat chunky jazz necks big fat chunky jazz necks that's all I'm accustomed to when you when this baby lands in your shop you better know what what your what your goal is and you study your subject train your hand and your eye and and if you're building something that you've never felt before then uh, 
I'm just going to read this off. Go visit a vintage guitar shop or a retailer that, that is in your town or possibly, you know, drive, drive two or three hours and visit someone that, that, that you know has a 1958 something that is your, your favorite dream come true and or uh, say you're just going to build a Strat. There's, there's a lot of vintage Strats out there and just go visit the local shop and shoot straight with them. Tell them, look, I've been working wood for 25 years. I've never built a guitar. I, I'm going to do it. I really want to do it. I know eventually i got to spend another $1,000 for electronics, paint work, fret leveling, fret plecking, all these things. I'll go ahead and give you a deposit of 250 bucks, and, I'll, and I want you to do all that work. Or, you know, this, that, and the other. Or, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go ahead and buy all my pickups from you. Or I'll go ahead and buy all of my, my bridge, my tuners, my da 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 Man, what you'll find, you'll see that guy's face light up and he'll realize you're not a you know what artist and he'll 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 go lock the front door on the shop and he'll sit down with you and he'll pull out a box. He'll pull out a box full of 1958 Bigsby's or you know, he'll pull out a, a box of 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 a bridge that belonged to someone you had no idea you would ever see it because let's say you're in california shit happens all the day guys walk in and sell something and it just so happens that they just came off tour with you know who and they're selling their parts off their guitar you'll be shocked at what once you make friends with the guys in the, in the pro side of the arena man they'll bend over backwards to help you pull this off so I think that makes perfect sense. Vintage guitar shop reeler asking if oh and just basically ask him, hey, can I play some of the old vintage guitars? I want to truly feel this fat neck. If I may like that, or maybe I hate that. And 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 just you know, don't go in there with a with a tracing paper and a and and um, <laughs> a silly putty. You know, don't be over there in the corner. You know, ripping off their their their. Uh, vintage neck but just shoot straight with them and they'll tell you what they don't have a problem with you doing or they'll let you know no don't you dare measure the body width on that 58 Les Paul you do that I'm gonna throw you out the front door so just be real cool and talk to them and ask them what what they would permit and then you'll be surprised uh, how much they'll do for you um, and obviously, as I said, mention to them that you know you got to buy these parts anyway, and that way you'll have someone on your on your team that really can explain to you. No, you don't want that bridge because it's it's not a four millimeter stud; it's a three point five millimeter. Blah 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 blah, and it might save you fifty bucks or hundred bucks here and there. And again, you know, you'll probably be hiring them to do the electronics or the wiring or the final setup. Just like uh, when I was living up in Franklin, Tennessee. For so long, um, I met Joe Glazer, and he plucked a 50, my 57 Gretsch 6120, and uh, it was real cool to get to meet Joe. I had no idea who he was, what he had done, but Joe was really at the cutting edge of doing some incredible telly stuff back in the 90s. Didn't even know it. I'm sitting there in his shop just shooting the breeze with him, and he's just a normal guy. You know, it was really cool. And um, so anyway, the, the true benefit of that is... The new friendship you get uh, and the respect, uh, you'll find that, I'm just going to read this off, for certain you'll receive uh, possibly, if you want it, if you've got a shop set up at your house, you'll be surprised, you know, let's say you, you, let's say you take this into a custom shop up in Nashville or Atlanta or LA and you show them that and they put their paws on that, man, you'll be shocked. The, you'll, ha you'll, have a, you'll have a work order request from five different guys that money's not the issue and you you know you'll be selling next for a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars or pick your price you know you know you know they're they're not idiots but this is not a hundred dollar neck it's not a three hundred dollar neck from you know where this is this is the creme de la creme stuff so what you'll do with that new friendship you'll probably end up um, uh, taking orders if you so choose and the cool thing about that is you'll be able to hone your skills and maybe even uh, become a specialist at a certain thing. I know a long time ago, 
I landed a Philip Kubicki uh, Fender Teleneck off of uh, eBay. Now, I had already owned a Philip Kubicki back in the uh, mid 90s that was the pink paisley with a, a the t uh, uh, and it was a true Philip Kubicki body as well as the uh, Philip Kubicki Teleneck. And love that guitar, it was amazing. Didn't know who the hell Philip Kubicki was in the 90s, didn't care, really didn't have the internet. And I just saw this logo, it said Kubicki Technologies LA. And I'm thinking, well, cool, it's from LA. So, long story short, 10 12 years later, I trip up on a Kubicki, landed it, bought it, and I thought, what the heck, I'm just gonna call and see if I can talk to somebody at Kubicki and ask them a couple questions. Kubicki answers the phone, <laughs> and I'm sitting there. It's like my buddy just told me, you know, you know who wants to go out on a date with you and you're like pinching yourself. I couldn't believe Philip Kubicki answered the phone and he was so cool and he was so nice. And I, I once I collected myself, I asked him, you know, what I needed to know. And I thought how cool that was that I got to speak to someone who had really had an incredible impact on the world of music. And uh, there he is in his shop. Why? Because he loves working wood. Or he loves, he's past now. But anyway, neither here nor there. You'll, you'll make friends and you'll find that it's a small world after all. And um, same thing, and I'll throw one, I'll throw one more plug. Because when I was in Franklin, uh, I was always a big Prince fan because of the, the, the jazz side of Prince. And I was building a revised cloud. And it was incredible and still is. I still have that guitar. It's extremely rare. And I was trying to gonna try to figure some way to get it to Prince. And um, but then there was a part of me I loved it so much I wanted to keep it. But I'll be you know what? I'm at a local bar in Franklin one night, it's a Tuesday, and I run into Jesse Johnson from the time. And I'm sitting there hanging out with Jesse Johnson talking about Sheila E, you name it, everything, and I'm and I and I realize it is such a, truly a small world, and I mentioned to him about the guitar, and there was a possibility I could have gotten that guitar to Prince, but it that never materialized, neither here nor there. But what I'm saying, by going and knocking on that door to that custom music shop, you'll be shocked what it can turn into, especially if you can really do this right here, and really pull it off. And I'm talking from, from raw wood. So, all right, let me stop talking about that. And I probably got way, way long-winded. Not too bad. We're under 23 minutes. But what I do think is very important, and I'm just going to grab this because I put it to the right. I've already talked about fitting that. Um, and I talked about the thickness of the uh, left. Let me, let me try to collect myself and not, not panic and not rush the, the video. What I was going to mention in the other video about the nut, that's, that's where I need to go with this. And I so hope we get at least to 25 minutes. And if it cuts off, I'm going to do another video and we're going to discuss layout and nut locations. Nut locations versus the 16th or the 14th fret location, which is found in one of the other videos. You see these two lines. See the upper line? The, up, the upper line is where it, it takes off on the pitch. That's the top side of your nut. The lower line, which is right there, I don't know if you can see it, it doesn't matter, just trust me, the lower line is right there. Well, why? Well, because that's 3 sixteenths of an inch. That's the thickness of my nut. Okay? And so this is where I was talking about, remember, we're, we're engineering, engineering it back from this point up to the nut then we know where we can pitch our 17 degree, I'm sorry, that, then we know where we can pitch our 17 degree headstock or 16 degree headstock, et cetera, et cetera. But this is where, this is where it really gets um, pretty critical. Let's say, let's say we were gonna do a Floyd Rose. Well, look at that, okay? And let's say we wanted the Floyd Rose to end right there at the pitch. Now we have to ask ourselves. How in the world are you going to get that to work? You're not. It ain't going to work because you can't change this location right here if you haven't built the body yet. So what has to happen now, this neck has to extend 
the additional length of the Floyd Rose nut in order before it goes into its pitch. And if you don't understand that, just rewind it and kind of think through the whole idea of and it, all it is is just based on the massive difference between a traditional nut and a Floyd Rose and the whole Floyd Rose platform. And that's kind of a nightmare in itself. But in in addition to that, I'm just gonna push this forward and just kind of keep in the back of your mind that's the that's the top side of the nut. This this guitar right here, well yeah, let me just show it on this one. I hope the video continues because I'm kind of in stride here. This this fretboard I did take it all the way to that point to where it started pitching. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, you're contradicting yourself, and how's that going to work? Because now, now you don't have a flat surface, but you've got this nut, and well, how's that going to work? It's going to work because I've got some really thin... God, I'm so sorry about the camera. I apologize. I'm probably way off. I'm going to have an extremely thin veneer on this headstock because I'm already at 5 eighths of an inch thick there and I'm already 9 sixteenths of an inch thick here I have my traditional jazz guitar pitched uh, headstock and then I don't have an overlay if anything I could paint this it's just going to be a standard it doesn't have binding so you see how the engineering is is, complete, is completely different on on this neck because I don't have the thickness of the uh, overlay. That's what I was trying to kind of drive home in the last, in the end of the last video, that you can't just say, oh yeah, go up here to 20 something inches or 14 inches or, and then start pitching. It's going to be different every guitar you do because it's going to be dependent upon what type of nut you're using, uh, the scale, the engineering, and that's what I meant a couple of videos back about you wouldn't believe how much engineering has to be done before you get to this little stick. So I think I covered that pretty well. Um, I don't feel like I missed anything. So even if the video cut off, I think that makes sense that draw it out, truly sit down with a large piece of paper and really work these things out. There's nothing wrong with going online and asking some questions about things like that. Uh, and then even there's like fret, fret, fretboard scale calculators that are online. I think Tundra Man is a pretty good one. I like that. He's got an easy, easy program to use. And then uh, just start kind of considering those things. But always remember, uh, look at look at where you're working from, and you should be fine. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to talk about necks anymore. So I'm gonna get them out of sight, out of mind. So hopefully they don't distract me. And we're probably we're already at 28 minutes. Uh, all I'm going to do, I'll just show you briefly how I would start this. Tell you what I'll do. I'll just talk about the painting a little bit. See if I can get the body in the... And how it blended. It blended very nicely. And I, there's, there's just, this is hard to do with the body. It would have been easier if I just pulled the camera off because since it's probably going to end within a couple of minutes, uh, just want to show it but when I taped all this off I'll just lay it down so I don't have to keep handling it when I taped all this off I literally taped it to the minimum point to to leave as much of the original as possible and one thing I did fail to mention is when I brought the paper and the, the tape up anytime I would spray or paint I would sand that that paint the new paint all the way up to the tape and I would even sand the tape off a little bit because I was really wanting to make sure that I didn't build up a real fat thickness of, of paint mill thickness out here and then pull everything off and realize oh crap now I've got a now I've got a ledge that drops off that that I, I can't hide so now when I come in with my sandpaper and I have not tried this yet this is worn out 400 not it's not going to be very effective but now I can truly feel the transition and I realize wow that's cool if anything it almost feels perfectly flush just in one or two two hits and uh, I don't think there's any need to start sanding or anything but what I what you could do is just start working into your sandpaper and asking yourself well 
you know, how, how much of this can I sand? Because this up here is going to have to get buffed in. It would be it would be absurd to call this finished and send it to the client, and then he's sitting there looking at it, going, "Oh man, I know I told you I wanted a patch quilt, kind of cool relic job, but I kind of wish you had have sanded that in now now that we can't even see the repair." And I'll shoot straight with you. I wasn't expecting that. I was. Ex Let me see if I can pick that up again. I don't see it. I was not expecting that. You can see where I built up that <laughs> that area under the bridge a little bit, but I don't see any of our repairs. You take this to Gruen. You take this to Carter. Now that that you see right there, that's just the paint. Or you take this to Norman's, or you're in L.A., you take this into a vintage shop and show them what you did, man, you'll be getting $1,000 orders all day long to restore a 1958-something or a 1964. Uh, you'll be in business so fast, your head will spin. <laughs> so, it's really cool. And what's awesome is we've still got our old... Let me see if I can just put it up here. still got our old guitar and what's so cool I haven't mentioned this and I hope the phone lasts it still smells old and I, I was so hoping that we could maintain that but it still has some of the vintage musky smell to it and that's that's when you know you got a real guitar because that's something you cannot fake so that'd be a cool place for the video to just end right there beautiful guitar it's turning out really really well very happy with it and it'll be funny if the video lasts because this will be this will be for you for you Bigsby guys. That's like sex on wheels, man.